Broadcasting live from the moon and back, this is The Coin Chat, the most trusted voice for all things cryptocurrency. Each week, we dissect an important issue and cut through the noise and misinformation out there in the world of blockchain, cryptocurrency, and ICOs, capturing the facts that truly matter to you that will give you an edge in this fast-moving emerging market. The who, what, where, when, and how of what you need to know in crypto to get ahead so you don't get left behind. Now, here are your co-hosts, financial and crypto experts, Yuri Cataldo and Steve Good. Hey, this is Steve Good on The Coin Chat with... Yuri Cataldo, as always. Welcome back. Cutting through the noise and misinformation in cryptocurrency to tell you everybody, tell you what really matters. That's right. Only what matters. Only what matters, because lots of things matter in life, but we're only going to tell you what really matters. So That's true. Today, uh, Yuri, I think you wanted to ask some questions because I was away last week in Singapore on a, a little bit of a mission, but it was I went to a, a private fundraising, not fundraising, what am I saying? A private investors and ICO gathering, a networking yes. event, which was really cool. And I got invited because of my show, our show, and because of being an advisor out in crypto. And they just wanted to have some personalities that were there to help them look at the projects and talk to people. So it was really cool. So well, perfect. I know you wanted to ask some questions and I'm sure many people would like to know what is it like to go to one of these private events where there's about 60 people in a room, including crypto <laughs> whales. Exactly. And I like how you just asked you your own question that I was going to ask. No, I just, <laughs> I, no, I really didn't. I'm not going to ask you anything else. No, no, I know that. It was just kind of funny. I was like, that was my first question. So yeah, yeah so well, first question? welcome back from Singapore. Yeah. I would like, like to know, so what is it like to be in a networking event with crypto whales? Also, I'm glad they invited you for your personality because you oh. do have a, a, a good personality. Well, so. Whales just take up a lot more space. Uh, no. Physically? And <laughs> no, to be well, honest. Emotionally. You, let me tell you how you could spot a whale. This, okay. This is, a, this is a really good one. So the better dressed the person was, mm -hmm. the less money they probably had. Oh, like the, the tech philosophy on that yeah, one. Yeah, because, you know, the thing I noticed was the, the most, let's say, mild-mannered and low-key they were, the less they were trying to draw attention, the worse they dressed. Mm. Now, I didn't really think that would be mm -hmm. true in Asia so much, the way we yeah. see in Silicon Valley or in London, but, I mean, I'll tell you what, <laughs> it was certainly applicable there, too, because I know I met a variety of people. I met some Chinese family offices. I met some a couple of different guys who would, would be considered whales, you know, coming, having mm -hmm. gotten in early. They were, you know, you ask them questions. They said, you know, I got in 2010 and mined or invested and then sold and then held USD Tether for a while, blah, blah, blah. And so you get these stories. So you get a sense as to who the people were that had some success stories and some, you know, yeah. what they've invested in as well, which were also interesting, you know, indicators of their, of their success. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was pretty interesting. So there was a real range of people, including people that showed up to the event supposed to be, you know, savvy investors who know about crypto. And I mean, I met one guy and talking to him for half an hour, teaching him what crypto is, at which point I handed him my card and said, here, just come to our show and you can learn the rest. Because <laughs> I'd like to go mingle with everybody. But it was really yeah. hilarious because there were a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. It wasn't just crypto, you mm -hmm. know. Investors, there were also organizers, there were uh, other social media people there. So it was a really interesting range of people um, just there to network and to really connect on a very close personal level. That's great. So, how is this networking event different from, let's say, like a fundraising event? What are some, I know you've been to both. What are some yeah, things? So fundraising, or, I mean, first of all, to do fundraising, there's something legal that you have to have what's called a broker dealer license, which is mm -hmm. a regulatory license. And okay. if you don't have that, then you shouldn't be doing fundraising at all. And also yeah. in fundraising, you'll typically do a, 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 you know, an honest ask and you'll say, look, I'm looking to raise $5 million. Sure. I have this kind of whatever. This is our plans. This is what we're doing. This is where we're going. And that was definitely not being done at this event for a reason, because we were, we were there to network, presenting different projects to give people a sense of, you know, so there were ICOs there presenting or our mm -hmm. STOs presenting what they were doing. There was a range of different types of projects, which was really interesting to listen to, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, sure. uh, and equally, there was a range of different types of people in the audience. There were about 80 people in the audience that ranged from investors to, you know, different types of media people, other types of fundraising, not fundraising, what do you call it? Um, event organizer types. Mm -hmm. 
social media people, some other social influencers, uh, so consultancies that are obviously running services. Okay. So the, the, the bulk of the people there were actually, you know, VCs and family offices, either crypto VC, venture capital, or mm -hmm. um, some, of them were, some of them were, you know, normal venture capital who hadn't branched into it. Um, actually, there were some exchanges there as well. So it was a really oh, wow. weird kind of, yeah, because some of, the, some, of the, um, the, some of the exchanges have like their own venture capital funds where they, they look to the future of ICO and STO projects to work out who's who and what's what. And sometimes right. they might redirect them later to their own fund to say, hey, we, we're interested in investing in you, not, not exchange listing you. So mm -hmm. that was pretty interesting. They're you know, kind of an interesting range of people. Yeah, yeah. So what were some, because you said that I, uh, there were a number of different presentations that happened. What were some sure. interesting projects that, that caught your eye? Uh, well, there were a couple that were really interesting that I'll actually, I'll, I'll shout out to them as well. So there was BitCurate. So, mm -hmm. so a shout out to William. I'll, I'll sure. let you know. I'll let him know about this. He's a cool guy. Uh, so yeah. w William's got this social um, sentiment AI project that he's that his he and his, his company is doing. He's the founder. Mm -hmm. So really cool. I really liked what what they were doing. Um, early stage, not ICO, not STO, just building software. Hmm. And I like that. And it's just mm -hmm. focused on the crypto sentiment, the all, you know, scanning multiple channels, using AI, trying to get a level of accuracy in the data to give people good indications of when they should buy or sell certain coins for trading. So that was yeah. pretty cool. Uh, then there was another one that I thought was really interesting called Moby, which was, again, a software project, not an ICO necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, they may end up becoming an ICO, but for right now they weren't. And this was, uh, this was Bill. So shout out to Bill. And what was really cool about this is they're building a peer-to-peer -peer email system. Hmm. So if you think about email today, email is mm -hmm. all about client server. And because right. it's client server, you have mail size limitations. So what yes. they're doing is they're using a combination of blockchain plus peer-to-peer -peer technology to enable you to send any file size to anybody person to person. Okay. Using um, technology like BitTorrent, using technology like, you know, Napster, that kind of thing of the peer-to-peer -peer mentality. That's what they yeah. built into an email platform. And it's really cool. And they've got it working and they showed us a demo. And it's neat because it's not just email, but you can have like different skins. So you can effectively, they could so make it look like, like a Telegram or a WhatsApp if they wanted to. Mm. And group, so you could have groups of conversations and see all the conversation and dialogue going together. And yeah. you could equally see all the files you've received in a separate folder, like a Dropbox. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So that was pretty neat because I'm not a big yeah. email fan, as you know. I try to stick to the Telegram nowadays. But <laughs> right. seeing something that might be disruptive to WhatsApp and Telegram and email and be peer-to-peer -peer was pretty neat because yeah. I could just send you, you know, a two terabyte file if I want to, and you'll eventually receive it. And there won't be any, you know, rejections of files. So that was pretty neat. I liked that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're, so you mentioned both of these projects, not I, like pre-ICO, not thinking about that. Were, that was that how most of the projects were? No, most, were of some were actually, like a, most of them were actually token model, you know, okay. uh, token economies of some form. Most of it, most of it was utility tokens. Some of them were security tokens. Okay. Uh, which was interesting to see kind of the shift and how much of it's become security token. And I would mm -hmm. say. I think there were people thinking about it, but not many people really doing it yet. And even dare I say some that were advertising, you know, utility tokens, but it was clearly a security and they just weren't aware of it. And okay. I did have the opportunity to talk to one project to ask my opinion. And I said, you do realize that this token is tied to an asset, which makes it a security token. So yes. you might want to rethink your model. And they were like, uh, could you explain more? So I ended up sitting <laughs> with one, one of the projects for about, probably a half an hour just kind of talking through like what to think about and how to structure the project correctly and, you know, not getting into all the details, but just giving them a flavor of what they don't want to do because I didn't want them breaking the law by accident. So that was pretty right. interesting because I still think there's a lot of people who just don't know what a security is or what an asset is, or that if you have a utility token and you say it's tied to, you know, my equity or my cash, that it's just, not a that's that it's just not a security, but it becomes one. And right. it's really interesting to see how many people just didn't understand that at all. Right. Interesting.
Yeah. Well, I know we've discussed security tokens on this show before. We have. So other other than let's say you know you noticing more security tokens, is there any other kind of trends? I know this was a smaller event, but are there any other kind of trends or just commonalities that you noticed that were happening that you haven't seen at previous events? Um. No, same old no. Sh- rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> lots, lots of crap. Um, yeah. Oh well, so yeah, actually, no, there is one trend actually that wasn't. That, this okay. is actually, yeah, this is actually pretty cool. So what I okay. did see more of, and I'm hearing more of, is a term called the reverse ICO. Okay. What's so, what's that? Okay, so that is basically companies that already exist that decide they want to move backwards into the blockchain. So they're going to reverse into the blockchain via some form of ICO, raising some funds mm-hmm. so that they can actually launch a blockchain-based project. So rather than using their own internal profits to do it, they're just launching subsidiaries and backing mm-hmm. into blockchain by way of the ICO. Okay. And so that was a term that was being thrown around quite a bit, actually. So I hadn't quite heard that term used that much. So now I'm fully aware that a reverse ICO is really existing companies backing into blockchain from existing core businesses that are probably based on database and centralized and then moving to decentralize the blockchain. So that's really interesting. And there were, I think two of them that I saw out of 11 projects that were doing that. Okay. So that was cool. That was interesting. And that's a, it's obviously a hot topic. And what's more interesting is that Mm -hmm. I could not justify why either of those projects was actually using blockchain at all. But just because they were existing businesses, they got more attention because they were moving their core business from database to blockchain for storing transaction. And because they were mm-hmm. doing that, they got attention, even though there was no real justification for why blockchain was needed, at least not right. they presented it. I didn't see it. I was like, why do you, you don't need a blockchain for this. You've got an app, you've got a database, you've got users. So carry on. And yeah. it was yeah, yeah. joining the hype because of, and that's a little bit worrying for me. It was like companies joining the hype just to just to, to raise money which I'm not sure that's really the reason I want to invest in a project is because they're an existing company. They already have money. Now they want my money to build something that may or may not necessarily need blockchain. But but anyway, so a trend and some commentary that goes with it. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. No, no, that's, that's good. I've also noticed not this event, other places where a lot of existing companies are, you're right, backing into blockchain and you're right. Basically, they already have a database, and that's just what they, they're just using the word blockchain to build up on the buzz right now. So it's interesting that it that's is. also and, popping up a lot of places. And I'd like to see a, a, a good use case for why they need to switch to blockchain as well. Uh, yeah. Sure, there's probably reasons for doing it if you're talking about consensus reward, reputation building, and, and participation of users, and you know, giving them tokens for participation. All that's great, although you know, it's one side of the token. <laughs> but, but sorry, bad pun. Anyway, um, but you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. But um, you know, I, there, there has to be more to it than just you know giving out free money. That that's not exactly. enough for me because that just creates abundance, and abundance causes a coin to drop in value because there's too many coins in the market by giving them away away free. So obviously, you need to have people participating that are also participating and doing things with the coin or buying them. So, you know, what I didn't see was that side of it with the existing businesses. So there wasn't enough for me there yet, but I think that's going to evolve too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious on why you decided to go to this event. So I know you've been to many, many. (laughs) So yeah, is that like, so how do you, for our listeners and watchers, how, what's your criteria in going to event? How do you kind of gauge beforehand if you think it, it'll be worthwhile? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, for for the, the general public, most people tend to go to these large scale, two, three, four, five thousand person events. Yeah. You don't find me at those for uh, for one reason, well, several reasons. One is it's just too many people that how mm-hmm. am I going to connect with the people I want to connect with? Um the, the higher end investors oftentimes aren't going to those events for the same reason. It's just too many people. It's hard to network and connect with the people you want to connect with. There's no yeah. intimacy. On the flip side, these large events are great for, for one thing, which is you get some really good speakers. Um, and of course, if I'm invited as a speaker to these events, I will go. But generally right. with these really big events, it's just really hard to, to get connected. But it's great for getting lots and lots of you know, 
juicy information and great presentations. So there's the plus and minus. I like to go to the small.